welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Tasneem Abrahams. I'm the founder of the Private Practice Grow Club. And on this channel, we ch chat about all things private practice, how to start, grow, and scale a private practice successfully in South Africa. And today I have the lovely Stan Hutton from MedZone. Um, uh, MedZone is a medical billing administration company. And we're going to get into all into the details about what that is and what services they provide. But I think you're really going to love what we're going to talk about today because it's one of some of the most commonly asked questions that I get. How do you med register with medical aids? How do you bill? How do you get you know, get your fees that are due and owed to you? How do you prevent bad debts from piling up? All of those good stuff. So welcome, Stan, and thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Tasneem. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm really excited for today's conversation. I think, you know, we're covering some really good topics to help practitioners just navigate the whole medical aid scenario in their businesses. Yeah, and the reason why I invited you on is because obviously, um, you, when you started MedZone, one of the things you did was start a blog. And I really um, valued the information you share on your blog. It was very useful, very easy to understand. I think that is also the problem. It's like sometimes you get the information, but it's not like in that, not digestible. It's not for like the everyday private practice owner who is not, don't have their business, you know, they don't have really a business head on. And it's like uh, the way that you just describe common common things that come up was really helpful. And I thought I must get you on. And so um, let's dive right into it. I think, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about MedZone? What do you do at MedZone? What is the role of a medical billing administrator? Sure. All right. So MedZone's a, we're a small independent billing administrator. So what we look at is to actually be able to assist healthcare practitioners with what I call the kind of three big struggles. And the first one would be is obviously to get that invoicing and billing out on time, accurately and correctly, whether it's going to the patient or the medical aid. And then the next side of that is what we call obviously your payment allocation side, making sure that all the payments that have come in, whether it be via your bank account, or via medical aid are actually assigned to the correct invoice for a patient. And then it's the medical aid follow-up. That for me is obviously the most time consuming thing for most practitioners. You know, during a busy day, when you're seeing back-to-back -back clients, you really don't have the time to spend two hours or three hours on the phone chasing up on those unpaid medical aid claims. It, it just takes away revenue that you could be making. And more often than not, it's probably your two most frustrating hours in the day. And then the other side that we run is what I call payment reminders. Nobody likes to speak about bad debt. Nobody likes to speak about money, but we also tend to forget that sometimes life happens. You know, we send out an invoice at the end of the month and expect that somebody's going to pay, which is actually what should happen. But oftentimes, people forget. And just that simple nudge of, you know, don't forget your payment is due is helpful. And more importantly, that nudge of, okay, your payment is now overdue prevents that nasty situation when you're going to somebody three months down the line going, well, you owe me money. So mm. where we fit in is to make sure that the invoicing and the billing goes out on time every time to the medical aid or the client. And then more importantly is to actually follow up on whether you have received those payments. And if you haven't received those payments, what can be done either via negotiating with a medical aid to see was there something wrong on the bill? Was there something maybe incorrect on the invoice? And then with the patient, uh, what happened? How come payment wasn't made? And like I say, life does happen, but sometimes also you have human error sitting at the medical aid side. And if you don't follow up soon enough, you find that by the time you do follow up, the patient's savings have now been used and you're having to go to that patient and say, well, now you've got to pay me anyway. Mm -hmm. So as you try and solve that time lapse between when the account should have been paid and when you eventually speak to the client to get them to make that payment, I find that's often a huge delay and it mm -hmm. actually causes a loss of revenue for practitioners. Yeah, and also, um, obviously, that means if you are more efficient with that, it means that you improve your cash flow. And everybody knows that in business, cash is king, right? So um, improving, you might be very profitable on books, but actually you're struggling on a day-to-day -day because you're waiting for payments to come in. And in the meantime, you still need to pay bills and staff and yourself. <laughs> well, 
Exactly. If you look at, take a very simple example. If you've got a purely cash practice and you're only billing at the end of the month. So let's say your billing runs the 20th or the 21st. Most people only get paid on the 25th. So that means your payments mm. are only coming in 25th, 26th, 27th. Your debit mm. orders might be going off on the 1st. So you yeah. need to be chasing up with the guys who haven't paid between that 25th and the 30th. Otherwise, your debit orders are going to bounce. So yeah, sometimes yeah. your funding might only come in in the first week of the new month. And, you know, you've got a whole month's worth of invoicing. What happens if 10 people don't pay you? Mm, you know, mm. So if we use a simple example as an occupational therapist, you could be billing a patient, let's be fair and say anywhere between 650 and 1,000 rand a week, depending on what you're doing. At the end of the month, you're looking at maybe a 4,000 rand bill. Mm. If this person doesn't pay you on time, that's 4,000 rand out of your cash flow. Yeah. You know, take that two, three patients and suddenly you're sitting 12 grand short on your cash flow. Mm. And now they need to pay that off over a couple of months. So, you know, that's where that quick, quick billing and efficient billing does come in. But more importantly, that follow up, that reminder of, hey, what's going on, just yeah. nudges them on. You know, if you're not top of mind, you know, you're going to fall yeah. away. And I think that's yeah, the and big I, thing I think is. that is probably the biggest reason why most private practice owners don't pay themselves because they often are dipping into their own pockets to cover the cash flow deficit that they're having in their practice, knowing that there's exactly. money coming in, but so then they don't pay themselves. And then what does happen is when money does come into their practice, they dip into their practice to then replace what they've put in from their personal pocket, which is not good business practice. Um, so yeah, definitely. So tell me quickly then, what is the difference then when somebody's starting the practice? What is the difference then between or or when should one use the services of a medical billing administrator versus getting a practice management software and trying to DIY everything? Look, in all fairness, I would say having a, a practice management software and DIYing is fantastic. But what you have to remember is it's still it's that time it's the learning curve of figuring out how the software works. Once you figured that out, it's the time management of actually taking the time to send the invoices. Now, mm. you have got some phenomenal softwares out there that do automatic payment allocation from the medical aid, but they can't read when somebody's paid you cash, when somebody's paid into your bank account. So you still have to physically capture those payments, send those invoices and follow up on what's overdue. Mm. So I would say anybody who's not great at the admin side of things, should look at one, getting a medical billing software because it is going to help just ease that admin. But if you are like some of the practitioners that I know billing at 10 o'clock at night, because it's the only time you get, mm. you might want to look at actually getting an administrator on board, whether it be you know, a remote or an external administrator or potentially someone within your practice. That on its own though comes with the other side of things of now you've got HR to have to contend with. You've got a, next, a salary that you need to pay when this person's off sick or takes leave, what happens? So you've got to weigh up the pros and cons for each practice. Um, mm. Obviously, if you're a large multi-practice and you've got five practitioners or six practitioners and so on, then having a practice manager insight on is the way to go. They know your patients. They know how everything works. But if you're small, you know, one or two practitioners and really just have that I don't have the time to do the basic that that get the invoicing out during working hours so that I'm not, you know, my husband or my wife is not screaming at me at nine o'clock at night because I'm still working after coming home, putting, you know, having dinner, putting the kids to bed. I'm now back to work. It takes away from that personal life aspect. Mm. Um, and I've actually seen it with, you know, looking on back ends of software practitioners invoicing at like one, two o'clock in the morning. Because yeah. that's when they get a chance after. And that's, and that's, I mean, that's after they still need to also say they often because they're also using nighttime to do the clinical notes because they don't have to yes. have time to do that during the day. And now they do the clinical notes and they must do the billing as well. Yeah. Um, so it definitely takes time away. It does. But what it also does is when you look at it from the patient perspective, if as an example, if your patient's got a really busy email and your mm. email with your invoice is coming out at one, two o'clock in the morning, Tomorrow morning when they're checking their mail, they might actually miss that. Mm, mm. But now you're sitting in the situation of I've sent the invoice. 
but this person actually hasn't seen it because mm. they've come in in the morning and they've seen, okay, I've got, and they've skimmed through to see what emails they need to attend to now for mm. work. Mm. So, mm. you know, if your emails are going out at weird and wonderful times of the day as well, it does create, in, sometimes it can actually create that mislink in communication where yeah. the patient's going, but I never received an invoice. Mm. That's a really good point. So the next thing I wanted to ask is that um, if you are, it sounds like also if you are a cash-based practice, then so my experience is that if you're not claiming directly from medical aids, that a, a full on practice management software can be a bit of an overkill because you could just use an accounting software and yeah. create custom fields for your ICD-10 codes and your all of those things. Um, but then you could still use a medical billing administrator to manage the invoicing and billing and reminders and all of that without having to invest in practice management software. Would, would that be correct? hundred percent. And oftentimes what your billing administrator will do is bundled into their fee would be a software. Okay. So, you know, as an example, bundled into my fee is our billing software of choice. And included in that is obviously your calendar application. So you can actually book your appointments using the software, um, your bulk emailing facilities, which is also helpful for a practitioner to be able to just send mails. Um, and more importantly, you know, you've got an ability to actually upload attachments. So if you have done a report or something for a patient, you can actually upload it and link it to their file. Um, and then obviously the software has the built-in feature of being able to send a professional invoice, have statements and that kind of thing. But yeah, if you're not looking at an administrator or a billing company, then yes, uh, you can really, in all fairness, create a custom template um, and run your invoicing from a manual perspective, one of the things with that is just bear in mind that you might spend a little bit more time on your monthly invoicing. And then obviously that reconciliation side of actually being able to recon who has and hasn't paid you. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so, you know. So well, then the next question then is to register or not to register. That is the question, right? <laughs> when you're starting <laughs> out in private practice, um, you know, that is a big question is, should I be a cash-based practice where I bill patients, they pay me directly and they can get reimbursed from medical aids? Or should I register with the medical aids and claim on my patient's behalf? So that's the big debate. Um, what are the pros and cons of each? Look, let me give from my personal side of things. I think that it comes down to really the practice. Um, and what I always say to people is do some research, look around your area. If almost every other practitioner in the area is billing to medical aid, then you might have to look at the demographic of the area going, most people don't have, you know, the free flowing cash to be able to pay cash for consults. So mm -hmm. medical aid might be the, the best way to go. Other areas, you know, you might have people that are more willing to pay cash as opposed to medical aid. I generally say try and go on a 60-40, you know, okay. depending on make sure that most of your clients could be your cash-based clients. And then in certain circumstances, you do take medical aids. Um, and with that, it's the same. We've got something like 200 medical schemes in the country. It doesn't help to go and register with everyone. It, it, it's an absolute nightmare, especially if you are never going to deal with a client at FishMed, you know, mm. but to go <laughs> through the process of now, I, you know, so look at the medical aids in the area as well and then kind of decide, do you want to be somebody that goes through everyone or do you want to be select? I'll use an example. My GP down the road, literally it's you either on Discovery and that's classic and up or you're on Bonitas. Any other mm. medical aid, so sorry for you. We don't submit to those medical aids. It is going to have to be cash. We'll give you an invoice and you can claim back. So mm. you also have that option. And I think a lot of practitioners get a bit overwhelmed and go, okay, but I have to register with everybody. Yes. You don't. <laughs> yeah. you know, look in your area, ask practitioners around, you know, sort of what medical aids are coming up most regularly within your practices and mm. then look at, okay, those are the three or four that I'm going to register with and take it from there. 
But I think that's a good point because even in the private practice growth academy, one of the things I talk about a lot is before you start your practice, you know, it's very easy to get into the operational side of, oh, I need to register my number and I need to do get a logo and I need to find a place. But before that, think about, okay, who is it that you are trying to serve? Who is your target market? Do the market research because you might find that maybe the patients that you're trying to serve in the, in the first place, they don't have medical savings and you're in the type of profession. Like if you're a GP, it's easy. You'll get your money back, like, right? But as an OT, for example, or a speech therapist, not all plans cover or they only have a certain amount that covers um, all most of the patients maybe that you serve are on hospital plans. So they don't have medical savings. So it won't come, it won't be covered yeah. anyway. Then it's kind of futile to claim because you, you're going to keep getting you know, you're going to have to ask them to pay anyway. Whereas if you know that the people that you serve do have medical savings account, it's better that it will be a good marketing, um, you know, characteristic that they can don't have to pay cash up front that they can claim from medical aids. So definitely I think like people don't realize how much your market research and, and understanding your target audience is going to play a part in that decision. It's not just about making the decision like thumb sucking what you're going to do. (laughs) Hundred percent. You know, um, it, it, it's it's the same. I, I've had practitioners before that are based in really odd areas and kind of, but they want to. I'm going, but what are the three big medical aids in that area? Mm, it, it's mm. not going to help you to register with CAMAF yeah. if you're in the middle of Harankua. You know, <laughs> they, they, they yeah. aren't. You know, but what you could look at in that kind of area is going. Okay, well. There's a lot of government facilities around. That means there mm. could be a lot of GEMS employees GEMS, around. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, maybe it's beneficial for me to register with GEMS as opposed to BankMed. Yeah. You know? So it, it is. It, it, that research is very important. You know, if you know who your target market is and you know what their demographic is, it, it's a lot easier to make that decision. And mm. it saves you a lot of headache of registering with a hundred different medical aids. <laughs> but now, but now on that topic, right? So let's say you want to register with the medical aids. That's another question that comes up a lot. How do I register with the medical aids? So uh, just talk us through that process. Like if you, yeah, like what, what do you need to do? It, it, because as I understand, it's not like you just do it once. Most people think if they register on PCNS, then they'll automatically be registered. That's not how it works. <laughs> so take us through that. And also how long can you expect it to take? Because when you're planning to open your practice, it's good to have like know in advance, okay, more or less what the timeline is. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start off with the very basics. The first thing is obviously you do need to be registered with PCNS and you do need to be active and up to date with HSPCA. So there's a few documents that irrespective of the scheme, they are going to ask you for. So the one okay. is that PNS registration that generally has your practice number, your HSPCA number, address, telephone number, ID number, and at the bottom somewhere, your banking details. The next thing that you are going to need is obviously a bank confirmation letter confirming that those banking details do belong to you and then a certified copy of your ID. Now, some medical aids might go a little bit further and want a proof of residence. It's very rare, but it might happen. Uh, I think the most frustrating part of the actual registration process is that each scheme has their own process. Mm. So what I normally say is look at the big three. So when I say the big three, I'm going look at Discovery. They administer 22 different medical aids. So you have to register with Discovery once. Med Scheme, same thing. You have to register with them once. Med Scheme is actually really easy really easy to do and then the others i would look at is it goes in areas so mhg which is gems there's about seven or eight medical aids that they also administer so it's you know it's three sets of registration and you could be registered with nearly 60 different medical aids okay and then you've got your outliers your independent schemes like best med medihelp camaf profmed they all have their own different functions but your basics are the three bigs and then what i would do is for example with discovery it's you know what you just need to give the call center a call and actually say i I want to register as a healthcare practitioner i need to register my practice unfortunately their website is not helpful and actually does not have the forms available for download because (laughs) you know apparently healthcare practitioners don't need to have easy access to this 
but they will actually then send you the form that you just need to fill out and sign and tell you what to send with it. Now, more often than not, the consultant's going to say, okay, you can just email this back to, you know, you know, provider at discovery.co.za and you'll get a reference number. Now, what I found actually works best is that once you get that reference to say they've received the email, take the actual documents put them into an envelope and courier it to one discovery place and mark it for attention, um, health provider's desk, and put the reference number. It seems to go a lot faster when they have the documents in front of mm. them because you always get that we need this or we couldn't open that attachment. or So actually just couriering it to the office helps. Um, and with that best med categoric, they want originals and they do not accept via email. So if you're couriering to discovery you may as well career to best med in pretoria as well mm. med scheme is really helpful if you phone their call center same thing tell them you want to register the practice they'll actually ask you for your practice number and check with pcns they'll see that you are active on pcns and they will actually email you a form it's a quick form to fill out and attach with that a copy of your a certified copy of your id and you know, that bank confirmation letter. And within them, they normally take about three to four weeks to process and approve. So, you know, discovery, same thing, three to four weeks to process and approve. Um, my best advice, though, is just kind of follow up once every 10 days or so, just mm. to, for your own peace of mind, because otherwise you're sitting waiting for an email from discovery and it could wind up in your spam folder. And you, let's be fair, it all comes from the same email address. So you could miss it. Yeah. Um, James is also, it's a fairly easy process. What I'll do um, is, Tasneem, I'll actually just send you through a document after this with all the different links and email addresses. James is fairly easy. It's you send an email to implementations at MHG. Uh, with that, it's I want to register the practice for payment, copy of your BHF or PCNS, copy of your ID, proof of bank, and they're actually fairly quick. They normally take about seven or eight days to get it done. It's one of the few government things that seems to work quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Momentum well, also, uh, you, you can oh, yeah, get sorry, the no? information directly from Momentum. Um, I might actually have some of the forms on, you know, I've done a few registrations this year. So what I can do is just send you through the forms for this year, just mm -hmm. to help practitioners be able to fill out those forms and get those processes on the way. But like I say, my main advice is look for the schemes that are more popular in your area and register with those rather than mm. every scheme under the sun. And then limit yourself. If a patient says, look, I'm with Seasway Hosmed, unfortunately, we don't accept Seasway Hosmed. We accept Fed Health, Ned Care, and so, you know, limit yourself. It also gives you that ability to kind of save yourself from the hassle of dealing with every medical aid under the sun. Mm, mm. Yeah. yeah, so I, I think the timeline is really helpful because, you know, I have this workshop called your 90-day launch plan workshop mm. where it takes you through before when you're planning to open a practice, how to plan that 90 days before you actually, your, your opening day. And so yeah. it's helpful to know that, you know, in that timeline, in that 90 days, okay, that means in the first month, I need the first 30 days, I need to start that process of applying for everything so that I know within the next 60 days, within that time, I should get all that registrations complete so that by the time I open, I'm ready to go. But exactly. you mentioned something, which is something I was going to ask you about. You mentioned registrations you've done. For some people like myself, like this kind of admin just sounds like too much like of a headache <laughs> and I'd rather just like pawn it off to someone else. Is that a service <laughs> that you provide as well where somebody says to you, I mean, obviously you still, only you can, only I can provide my certified documents. So there's still going to be an admin involved, but just the thing of like emailing this one and, email and following up and all of that. Yeah. If I wanted to say, yes. Stan, please just help me out here. <laughs> what do you do yes. That? Uh, registration is a service that we do provide. Obviously with that being said, um, it's not for every medical aid. The way okay. I look at it is, you know, give me an indication of sort of which of the medical aids you're looking at. What I do try and do is obviously get best med, MediHelp, CAMAF, Discovery administered, med scheme administered, and then GEMS administered because that gives you the broadest range. Um, 
clients would then obviously have to send me some info, but I am going to send them a massive email dump and say, I need you to sign each one of these forms. Mm -hmm. I can fill out all the forms, but I need you to sign them. Unfortunately, it's, I often say this with billing as well. I can do all the billing. The only thing I can't do is diagnose your patient. So if you don't give me an (laughs) ICD-10 code, I can't invoice. It's the same as if you need me to register or you need a PMB form filled out, I can do all of that. I just Mm. can't sign it because, well, I'm not you. Mm. (laughs) Um, And yeah, we offer the service. It's 250 Rand and that's to get you registered on, like I say, the big three. And then we generally throw in MediHelp and BestMed as well. So it covers you for most of the schemes, um, which I find is a good start. You know, down the line, if you start seeing, okay, I'm getting a lot of patients that are on, I don't know, let's use Health Squared as an example then, you know, you might want to look at saying, okay, maybe I should look into registering with Health Squared, mm. but don't jump off the bat and go, okay, well, I'm going to register with Health Squared, C Squared, da, 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 because you just overwhelm yourself. Like you say, in that first 90 days, you want to be able to get up and running, but you also don't mm. want to be bogged down with absolutely everyone. And you can register with some medical aids down the line. It's not mm. like you have to be registered with everybody all at the same time. Yeah, so, it's like again, I always say, like, you know, in business, in. nothing is, not, no decisions you make is set in stone. So it's not exactly. like, you know, you married to only those ones and now you can't, like, you know, bring another partner into the mix. <laughs> 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 you can always change and down the line you can always change. So, I mean, that is what business is all about, constantly iterating and, like, checking, you know, what's happening. Okay, I'm seeing a lot more people from this medical aid. Maybe I should register with them then. But, you know, this is, I think, what you mentioned about, like, you know, you you can't diagnose, you can't provide the ICD-10 codes. That's a great segue into the next question I had, which is around, you know, a lot of questions come in around, um, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the claim was rejected because they said I used the wrong code or, um, you know, they're not put covering for this or why is this not, you know, why are the medical aids not paying for that or things like that. So tell me what are some of the biggest um, obstacles or the biggest issues you've found with your clients um, when it comes to billing? Right. So look, uh, I'll be very fair. One of the biggest obstacles comes in, especially with your physios, with their modifiers, where they're okay. using the modifier wrong or they're not putting a modifier onto their invoice and immediately medical aids. Sometimes you get away with it and they'll actually pay out. But the problem with that is a year from now, they suddenly realize they've made a mistake. Now they want to do a callback. So if your physio modifiers, as an example, your double zero eight, what it's supposed is it knocks that, um, tariff rate down by 25 or 50%. So if you're billing at full rate and they pay you at full rate, you might find down the line, they do a clawback and now you've got to pay them back that money Mm. or they're going to reject the claim because the clawback was wrong. Um, Or if using an example, um, so you're treating for developmental delay. Okay, as an OT. So, but you're using an ICD-10 code that's, not for developmental delay. Um, so as an example, you know, you normally use your, your 313, 315, you might use a 201, but then you find as well, you can't use 201 more than once in a week mm-hmm. as an example. So the moment yeah. you do that, they're going, okay, but you did observation and screening on Monday and then you did observation and screening again on Friday. Mm-hmm. That doesn't, you know, so th- there are some codes that, you know, a complex evaluation, you can do it once, but then you've got to remember that if you're doing a complex evaluation, that observation and screening is part of that code. Mm. So you can't double bill it. Mm. Um, then you get your ICD-10 code errors where you've got a physio. I'm using physio again as an example because it's more easy to, you've billed for something to do with spinal, but your ICD-10 code is all about, you know, arm. Uh, some things, so you've used the wrong BHF code. The BHF code should be, you know, proliferies instead of spinal. So they're Mm. immediately rejecting it going either one of the codes is wrong. So Mm. are you treating the guy for his back or his arm, Mm. you know, and that could cause a rejection. So, and more often than not though, some of the strangest rejections are simply the date of birth is incorrect. Mm. 
Mm. The wrong dependent code is used. Mm. Um, you know, the ID number is incorrect. And these are capturing errors that are causing a rejection and you have to adjust the claim, resubmit the claim. And, you know, that's, yeah. it's, it delays your cash flow. Um, but and if more we go back to like what you were saying about often practitioners are billing at like 11, 12 o'clock at night, um, then you're bound to make <laughs> capturing errors because you're so tired. <laughs> exactly. You know, especially if you think about it. I mean, if you look at your number pad on your keypad, it is so easy to click, you know, 212 instead of 313 or mm-hmm. 212 instead of 312. Mm. And that simple finger slip changes your BHF code and could null and void it. And look, I've seen with um, psychologists that instead of going 86205, they've gone 8605. Mm. So then they get a rejection going, oh, we need the tooth number. <laughs> uh, and instantly, you know, as a psychologist, you're looking at and you're going tooth number. <laughs> and then you look, oh, wait, uh, it was supposed to be 86205, but I've built 8605. So I've, I've built a dental code. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it it could be that. And then oftentimes as well, little things. Um, So if you've got PMB for a patient, so as an example, ADHD, ADHD isn't covered as a PMB. Mm. The depression and the anxiety that come with it are covered as PMBs. So if you're billing your F90.0 is your primary ICD-10 code, Mm. it's it's, going to come out of the person's savings. Yes. Not their PMB benefit. So you're mm-hmm. going to have the patient then go, well, I've got no savings, but you've got a PMB. Uh, it's, the PMB is on the wrong code. Mm. Um, and then also just because the psychologist's got a PMB doesn't automatically translate to the occupational therapist. Got a, well, a I'm glad you bring that up as an example because my my area is ADHD. Uh, um, you know, the 90.0 is my primary ICD-10 code. And I have clients who obviously they've got also depression, like you said. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, in the mental health benefit from discovery and the PMB benefit, you know, there's the mental health um, portion. They cover psych- psychosocial, so they cover psychological services, but they define that as psychiatrist, a clinical psychologist, or a clinical social worker. Yeah. who can provide psychotherapy. OT is not covered in that unless you're providing inpatient services. Yeah. Outpatient services are not covered. So it's really a th- difficult one because you assume, okay, well, now, you know, they've got a PMB, but actually now, you know, then the patient says, can't you like motivate? And you, But they won't because why would they pay something they don't have to pay? <laughs> exactly. So, you, you know, yeah. you do have those flip sides. It's, it's also very important as a practitioner, if you are looking at things like PMBs to actually understand what the formularies are, mm-hmm. what, you know, what is and isn't covered. And like you say, unfortunately, ADHD from an OT perspective doesn't seem to fall under, you know, PMB. And again, you've got to remember PMB is the prescribed minimum benefit. Mm. Um, so that is the base minimum that you would be provided in government. Yes. So if the government facility is saying, okay, well, we understand that you need, you know, psychological help for ADHD and you need medication for ADHD, but we really don't think OT is important, then it means, well, OT falls away. Mm. The, the best example I can ever give for PMB is if you take a broken arm. Okay. So the PMB under, you know, a broken arm is to, the treatment is to reset, cast, reset and move on. So the doctor should be covered. X-ray should be covered. Cast should be covered. Great. But if your doctor wants an MRI on your arm, the MRI is not going to cut, even though the diagnosis is it's a PMB, it's a PMB, it's a broken arm. The Mm. treatment isn't covered. Mm. So you have to remember that. And I think that's oftentimes where practitioners get, you know, a little bit overwhelmed as they're going, but this should be, it, it's a PMB condition. But if but the no, treatment I mean, isn't considered mm. minimum benefit that you would get in a government facility, it's not going to be covered. But now the thing is, I mean, these are not things that you as a clinician have time to like ponder and problem solve. I know. So, <laughs> As a medical billing administrator, I mean, you've been in this industry, what, like seven years now? 
Um, so, so is this so aside from providing the, the invoicing, billing, following up, and that is that also something that you provide as a service where you actually consult and assist where they can pick up the phone and say, Stan, I have this new client. This is the situation. Like, how do I approach this? Like, what is the best way? Should I rather treat them as a cash patient? What is your advice? Is that something that you also provide? It is something that we do provide. And what we also provide is we'll actually phone up the scheme on your behalf to say, look, okay. we, we have got a patient coming in. Um, there is an ADHD. So would this fall under, you know, what benefits does this person qualify for? You know, mm. can we get them onto a PMB? Yes or no. You know, and if it comes back as a no, then we can all say, okay, look, you're going to have to discuss this as a cash patient moving forward or, you know, these sessions are going to come out of savings. So you need to be able to be prepared to have that conversation of, mm. you know, once your savings are up, they're up. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that's always a difficult one, especially with, you know, stupid things with medical aids. I've got a client who's got twins. Mm. They both have the same, basically the same diagnosis. I think there's like one point difference. Mm. So they both have cerebral palsy, but the one's got slightly different to the other. Mm. The medical aid covers everything billed on the one. And then on the other, you know what, they cover everything. And then every couple of weeks, they skip one of the, you know, uh, treatment not provided you know, or treatment word. not covered. <laughs> and now it's that, and you know what, you don't think about it. it, it it's mm. 40 rand. You, you don't think about it. And then you go, okay, but wait, you saw this kid five times this week they've they've paid for three but they've rejected two that's 80 rand 80 mm. rand a week over four weeks you know what also doesn't sound like month add it up over a year yeah yeah and it's it's being able to follow up and go um sorry uh, um you know and that's another one to always be aware of as a practitioner when you're treating twins mm. you know what they're on basically their id numbers are almost identical Mm. their medical aid numbers are identical. Mm. So when those claims come through on the remittance, it's looking through and then having to follow back with the medical aid and explain, no, you've now paid too much for patient A mm. and you haven't paid for patient B. You need to mm. reverse this for patient A mm. and allocate it to patient B. It, yeah. it can be fun and games, but that's yeah. kind of <laughs> where a billing bureau comes in because yeah. – you you know, almost like actually, the PIs, the, the PIs of the, of the bank world. You must no, like investigate these cases. <laughs> well, yeah, especially because, I mean, sometimes you look at these remittances and uh, the classic example is discovery. Discovery tells you we've paid a lump sum. Mm. Okay. Now, you, now, if you've got two members on the same medical age, you've now got to go through line item for line item to see who did they and not who did they pay for and who didn't they pay for? Yeah, yeah. Otherwise you do. And I've seen practitioners do it. They go, okay, well, discovery paid me six grand. It's three grand for you, three grand for you. Um, now you've got a shortfall somewhere. Mm, mm. So when you do that follow-up, you still have to try and figure out who the shortfall falls through. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, it is a thing of having to look and make sure when you get those remittances, which codes have been paid mm. and how much has been paid for that code. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm just thinking like, you know, as part of the legal requirements as a practitioner is that your clients must have, must sign informed financial consent. So, and that's, that goes beyond just your billing policy. You have your billing policy, but if, you know, if you, a client can actually like um, report you, if you didn't inform them upfront that they are going to need to pay um, whatever, because the medical aid doesn't cover. So it is important to have those open conversations with clients and, and actually do the investigations for them and like make them aware, um, you know, that actually you're going to need to save up for this because this is money that you're going to be owing out of your own pocket. And they, because nobody wants a nasty surprise. Um, yeah. So, so even just in terms of protecting yourself legally, um, it's important to, to have those things covered and, and look into that kind of detail. 100%. And I think it's also very important that in your terms and conditions contract, that not only do you have your billing policy, but as an example, and let's use OT, that you have that breakdown of, you know what, if you're coming in, this is what your first assessment is going to be charged mm. at. You know? mm. um, again, please be advised that depending, and this is a big thing that I say to people to have in their clauses, based on, you know, 
depending on your medical aid plan, your medical aid scheme and plan type, mm. uh, this might be covered. This might not be covered in full by your medical aid. So again, l- let's use a very classical example. Um, Discovery has key care. Mm. Key care is, you know, look, let's, let's call it what it is. It's basically a hospital plan. Okay. Mm. So a patient assumes, okay, well, it, I'm, I'm on discovery. Well, no, mm. you're on key care. Key care might not cover these. Mm. So yeah. you also need to be able to have that conversation of, and again, let's look at gems as an example, gem, a gems patient on one of their like barrel, which is one of their lower plans can't just go and see a physio. They need to be mm. referred by their GP. Okay. So immediately there, you know, when the guy says I'm with gems barrel, you just, the, the practitioner needs to be able to go, okay, I need a referral letter from your GP because otherwise mm. I'm going to submit this and they're going to tell me they're not covering it because you haven't been referred through. Yeah. So the, those things also can lead to, and again, not everybody has the time to go and figure all of that out. And, and mm. it's until you submit that claim and then go, okay, well now it's, and then you've got to speak to someone and the person goes, okay, well, this is why it's failed. Yeah. And it's a little bit late to go back to the patient and say, well, actually, you know, now your medical aid is not going to pay because I didn't get a referral letter. And so there is a lot more in and out to medical aid billing than is fair. And Mm -hmm. the other thing to also remember is if you're contracted into the medical aid, so you're submitting to medical aid, you have to bill medical aid rates. Mm. Yeah. Um, Because otherwise then the patient is going to owe you the co-payment. Well, look, firstly, yes, the patient's going to owe you the co-payment, but you know, you, you have the flip side, some schemes. So Sassel Med, if you've billed above the medical aid rate, they will pay you the medical aid rate and you have to go to the patient and say, there's a shortfall. Yeah. Discovery, on the other hand, if you've billed above the medical aid rate, they will pay the patient, the the medical aid rate. (laughs) Now you have to go to the patient and say, listen, I billed your medical aid, your medical aid paid you. You owe me what the medical aid paid you, plus they yeah. short paid. You owe me. Th- yeah. So you have to take that into account when looking into whether it is beneficial or not to register with medical aids. Yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. I've heard you know, I've heard that from people before where they've said, oh, they've, they've, the patients aren't paying them and they've got the money from, can they report them for fraud and all of these? And I'm like, no, well, you can just tell Discovery, but it's out of their hands. They don't care. They've done their duty. <laughs> it's now your yeah. job to get the money from your patient. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, listen, the last question I had is around Paint for me the picture of the operational side, the logistics of working with a a billing administrator. So let's say I decide, okay, I'm going to sign up with MedZone and how does it work? Do you like what what is the first, you know, the beginning stage of setup procedures? And then once we are all set up and ready to go, I have a patient coming in the door. Like, how does it work? What is the step by step? Okay. So, sort of if you sign up and whatnot, the first thing is I believe in open communication. So unlike most people, I've got a very firm thing of you can phone me, email me, WhatsApp me. Okay. <laughs> and again, it's because I know practitioners love their WhatsApp because it's quick and easy to send a voice <laughs> yeah, note they, between sessions they love as opposed to <laughs> opening your computer and sending an email. Yeah. Um, basically what I do is with a sign up is we first have an onboarding session. So the important thing there is for me to get to know how your practice works. So okay. as an example, are you registered with medical aids? Yes or no. Are you a cash practice? You know, when does your billing go out? Do you bill every day, every week, every month? You know, if you bill every week, on what day of the week do you bill? Um, and that's again so that we keep that sort of consistency with you. And then the next thing I sort of start saying is, okay, what I do need if you are registered from medical aid is I need access to your website port, your medical aid web portals. The reason for that is so that I don't have to say to you every week, I need your medical aid remittance. Mm, I can mm. go in, pull it and allocate payments. More importantly, I can go in if I've invoiced all your discovery patients, as an example, on Thursday, I can already go in on Monday and start checking, okay, which ones have already come, been flagged as not being paid. Mm. Now, that for me is an important aspect because I can already start getting a hold of that client and going, according to the latest remittance, discovery has said they're not going to pay this. This is why. Mm. So if your savings are depleted, I can let that patient know now that savings are depleted. I can let you know now that savings are depleted. 
Once I can get access to your medical aid portals, great. The other thing then that I always suggest is put an email forwarder on. So when Mm. your bank statement comes in, it forwards straight to me so that I can allocate any payments off your bank statement. And invariably what I'll do is we'll send a notice out to your clients asking them please to send their proof of payments to this email address Mm. as opposed to there so that I can allocate payments as they come through and send statements. Okay. Um, Obviously, I do suggest that practitioners use the software that I prefer. However, you know, you do have some practitioners that are now, they've now finally figured out how their software works. (laughs) They don't want to go and make any changes. Um, And with that, then the request would obviously be, then I need access to that software. So you would have to look into, is there going to be a cost for you to add me as a user on your end? Or can you add me as a user and just give me a username and password? Otherwise, you have to give me your username and password. I don't recommend that because Mm. it means that you don't have an audit trail. You know what? If I'm logging in as you, how do you know who made the changes? So Not only that, because some practice management softwares also come with clinical notes. So obviously, if you have the practitioner's username and password, it means you would have, even if you're not going to look it's still exactly, not, but it, um, get, it opens you up to, you know, a poppy violation. It, so, exactly, yeah. you know, what I generally recommend is if a practitioner is insistent that we use their software, then they are going to have to, it's going to be an additional cost on their side because they're going to have to get their providers to give us, you know, a user mm-hmm. that again, you know, could be a supervisory or an admin role or so on that doesn't have access to specific things like clinical notes. Mm. Um, you know, again, the person being, as an example, your billing administrator obviously needs to be able to get in, see the patient's contact information, that kind of thing, update any new contact information from a patient. They need to be able to bill, they need to be able to invoice, but again, they need to be at a position where one, they can't change any settings on your mm. software. Okay, Mm. so they can't go and change a telephone number, the banking details and that kind of thing. Um, And I say that openly and fairly because you never know if somebody can go and, you know, they're just going to change your banking details. It's going into somebody else's account. You Mm. suddenly going, what's going on? So Mm. you want to make sure that we don't have access to any of the settings. And most importantly, that there is no access to patient notes Mm. or clinical notes. Or if you've got a report from, uh, you know, whoever doctor that's linked to that file that only the practitioner has access to that. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the way I say it is I always bill. So if you do daily billing, I bill retrospectively. So I'll look on your calendar, whoever you saw on Monday, unless you've let me know that Joe soap didn't arrive, I'm billing Joe soap. Mm. So whoever's there is getting billed. Um, So ideally, you know, you can either mark them as a missed appointment or actually remove them from your calendar And then if you've got a new patient coming in, what I can set up for practitioners is an online intake form. So that Mm. means that you give me your current intake form. We convert it into an online version where the patient fills everything out. And as soon as they send it through, I get a copy and can actually start filling out, Mm. capturing that patient details onto your systems. And then already there, you know, you can kind of say, I'm seeing Joe Soap on Friday. He's a new client. You know, do you want to check with Med Scheme if there are benefits? Mm. So before the guy gets in, you know, we know as soon as he walks in for his appointment, you can say, listen, we followed up with your medical aid. You don't have any savings. These are going to be cash sessions. Mm. So you're having that conversation up front rather than a week after you've sent his invoice. And then the medical aid's going up and going, our benefits exhausted. So, yeah, you know, yeah. and so then tell me, how there, does the actual billing work in terms of, so say now a uh, Joseph is coming and do I have to tell you, no, cause maybe I don't know what I'm going to bill for. Like, especially like, you know, it's easy with when you're like a GP, they ch- tend to use the same codes, but like if I'm co- as an OT, for example, I mean, even speech therapists have generally very few codes. So it's not that many differences in what they can bill. Because they're both yeah. time-based codes. But with OT, you know, like our codes are very complicated. <laughs> so now, like, Look, do I then send you a WhatsApp or a message or an email to say, oh, these are the codes or this is what I did? How does that work? Like, how do you know? So what to- depending on kind of 
obviously the first assessment, the first session is always a difficult one because you're not actually sure at the time. Mm. But the, the software that I use has an option to actually build invoice templates. Okay. So you could have a template that goes, you know, initial session, including A, B, and C, and it's got all those codes. Okay. Um, and then literally you just attach that template to the invo- to the appointment. Okay. Alternatively, in all fairness, what I have had some clients do is at the end of the day, they'll go, you know, everybody was a 45 except for, you know, Joe Soap. Joe Soap, we did. 201, 313, 405, uh, you know, 512 and a, now I've really got to think of OT codes now. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so we, we did a little bit more. We, or you can just say we did a complex evaluation with observation and, you know, setting, you know, looking at a splint. Because mm. that's the th- biggest thing with OTs is obviously if you've done any splinting, any of mm. that kind of stuff, it's, you know, that I need to kind of know in advance. Um, mm. And yeah, you know. So, so you can say like, I mean, if you're not somebody who like wants to still deal with all these codes and numbers, you can just say, Hi, hey, Stan, this is the patient that I saw today and I did a complex evaluation specifically for executive functioning and ADLs yeah. or whatever. And then you will yeah. figure out, okay, what is the I'll best go, okay, code so, for this? Yeah. I did an ADL. I did a this. Did, okay. So it's going to be that code, that code, and that code. Okay. Okay. No, I so, think that would be such a relief, especially for those who are new practices, because it's also a way to learn the codes without learning at the end of time. Because now yeah. if... And then I, I would say to those practitioners who think, okay, yes, definitely. I need Stan in my life. I'm going to contact <laughs> them today. I'm going to sign up. Don't you know, don't, um, and it's similar with accounting as well. You're like, I'm going to get an accountant and then just going to forget about everything. Actually, like, let them do the work. So we'll let Stan do the work. But then when Stan submits the invoices, actually look at it and say, okay, so they use that code for that. So that you also learn by watching you almost like. So even yeah. though you're going to continue doing the service, just so that you for your own, like, knowledge and, ex- you know, experience get to know over time, you know, this is how it's done and familiarize with the self, yourself with the codes. I agree there. But my other thing as well is your comment that you made now, of, you know, you send it to an accountant and you forget about it. You've got to remember that as a healthcare practitioner, you are a business owner. Okay? Mm-hmm. And with that comes certain responsibilities. So even if you've outsourced stuff to a billing administrator such as myself, one of the big things that you do need to be able to keep an eye on is obviously... Um, has the invoicing been done? Mm-hmm. Has the invoicing been done correctly? And more importantly is, you know, ha- be able to, if you are asked, know that, okay, yes, I submitted an invoice for this on mm. that day to that medical mm. aid. Yeah. There is an accountability side of it. Um, and, you know, I think also just from an ethical point of view, it is important that you Yes, you might be learning or so on. Have a look at what those codes were so Mm. that down the line, as you get better and you get far more experienced, you can also kind of go, "Mm, actually, you know what? Yeah, I didn't quite see him for 60 minutes. Let's rather bull a 45 minute, you know, or recommendations. And uh, I really don't have to bull that every week you know that can Mm. be a once a month thing so you start to know which coding kind of goes where and are able to then also say to a patient you know look developing of a home program that takes time it Mm. costs money and let's be fair medical aid isn't going to pay for the whole lot so Mm. you know this is what we're going to have to do on that so that you know up front that you're going to have that conversation um, yeah. Otherwise, you get paid a you know peanuts for the amount of time you spend developing a home program. Yeah, and yeah. you know it's not like you develop a home program once for a patient. Mm. Uh, mm. I've seen, especially with like speech therapists, you know sometimes this is you know, every two months or so. Mm. Um, and your school based OTs, they might be developing something that to go home over school holidays. So it might yeah. only be billed once every three months, but it's a fairly large chunk. So yes, you need yeah. to be able to know okay, well, how much can I bill for this? Yeah. 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 And yeah. look, let, no, let's I, be fair, I, that's, we, we, that's we can't all advice. bill 5,000 rand an hour. We would love to. We would all be ecstatic. <laughs> we would work three hours a day. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, you know, that's, that's great advice. Exactly what you're saying. It's like, we need to outsource where we can, but you still need to remember the accountability still rests with you. So you need, you, it's absolutely, if you can afford an accountant to do your books, get that accountant, but don't, that doesn't mean you mustn't look at your reports and look at your accounts. Get a medical billing administrator to do all this um, stuff that you don't have time to do, but still go and have a look at it. And like you said, you know, your communication for you is important. So, you know, when when Stan sends you that email to say, this is what has been done, like go and look at it and understand it and ask questions and know what's happening in your business. Absolutely. That's the most important part. Ask questions. If there's something you're not sure about, something you're uneasy with, something you're unhappy about, ask the question. You know what? Don't just let it slide under. It, um, because you are a business owner, you know, it's the same exact example with your accountant. It's great that you send them everything and they do the report and they send it to SARS and this kind of thing. But you need to at least have some sort of idea of what they're doing. Mm. So you need to be able to understand, okay, what is my income? What is my costs? What are my expenses? What is my profit? How does this calculate out to that much tax? You, you know, you also need to have a vague idea of what you can and can't submit mm. as a tax deduction. I mean, you know mm. what? Drinks for friends on a, you know, Cosmos with the ladies on a Friday afternoon <laughs> aren't a business expense. Mm, you know? yeah. we, we would wish, we'd love if they were, but they aren't. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just also knowing what you can and can't do and also just, you know, at the end of the day, any invoice going out from your practice is under your practice number. Mm, and mm. it is important to know that, you know, that is your business. Mm, so you do want yeah. to just have an understanding of what is going out. Is it accurate? And if you're picking up some things coming back regularly as there's a problem, then, you know, that's where my side comes in as well. If I'm picking mm. up that you know, I'm getting a lot of you know, service not allowed, then at least I can come back and say to you, listen, something that your schemes are rejecting this. So mm. again, code, something's wrong on the coding. So let's have a look at maybe we change this code or that code to get it through, but they're not allowing you to do this. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, and I think also OTs, especially anybody with in-hospital stuff, you've got to, and that's where we come in as well as we can actually chase up and see, is that auth number valid? Are mm. you included on that auth number? You know, mm. are the dates accurate on that auth number? Because it's amazing how often, you know, that claim gets rejected, but the guy was in hospital and then you realize the OT wasn't included on the auth. Okay. Now you've got to yeah. go back to the case manager and say, uh, you need to include the OT services on this auth. Mm. And, you know, and if you're not doing it in time with medical aid, then they turn around and say, claim stale. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not yeah. paying you. Oh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> what, that, that would be awful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so, thank you so much, Stan. I think it was very helpful. I think you answered a lot of questions that people have all the time. I know <laughs> that billing and all of this stuff is like the worst part about private practice for most <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> Um, but Tom, to end off, maybe just share um, if people are interested in your services, how do they get hold of you? I will, of course, put all the links and contacts and stuff in the description box below the video. But yeah, tell us a little bit about how they can get hold of you. Uh, so in fairness, the best way to get a hold of me is like most practitioners, my cell phone is always on me. So drop me a WhatsApp. Okay. Um, otherwise, just pop me an email, shaz at medzonesa.co.za. Um, we also do have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page. So you're more than welcome to reach out on either one of those. Uh, as Tasneem says, she'll put the links on the bottom. But fairness, WhatsApp is your most likely way to get a hold of me because, well, like practitioners, my phone goes with me wherever I go because if I need <laughs> to quickly do something, it is so much easier to just click voice note and send it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just no, not awesome. at four in the morning, please. I'm still sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, especially if you like decide you're going to wake up at four in the morning to do your billing. Anyway, well, thank you so much. Have a great day. It was so great chatting to you. And I hope that we'll be able to collaborate again soon. Thank you so much, Tasneem. This has actually been really fantastic. <laughs> Looking forward to our next one. <laughs>